working seven days makes one week. You ever heard that? See what I did there? Week. It's called a homonym. There are two meanings to week. I got a little homonym poem. A doctor fell into the well and broke his collarbone. The doctor now will tend the sick and leave the well alone. You didn't love that one, did you? We have a lot of words in English that do double duty and triple duty. Uh, imagine that you, uh, you've gone over to your in-law's house for brunch, you've had a really nice brunch, and you know your spouse is just as comfortable at your in-law's house as, the, as, as your spouse is at home, and you're not. And so there you sit at the in-law's house, and, and you're, you're trying to make conversation, and your spouse is on the phone, enthralled, doing something. And it gets more and more uncomfortable, and your spouse looks more and more comfortable. Now, you have an afternoon or late afternoon appointment with some friends, and so you really would like to, you know, have some time in between to rest at home. And so the time goes, and... And so finally, you're about ready to go. Now, what you don't know is that all this time, what your spouse has been doing on the phone is playing on Zillow. Your spouse has found a place that your spouse wants to buy. And so your spouse is looking at this, and, and they've found the realtor and the price and the location and and. and really excited about it, but all of that's opaque to you. And so when you say, you want to go buy the house? Your spouse says, do I? Yes! Let's go buy the house. Now, obviously, you don't mean buy the house. The same problem exists in Greek. And in the first part of today's text, there are three words that do double and triple duty in Greek that are going to be somewhat opaque, certainly to the person that they were spoken to, but also to us. The first word is spirit, which in Greek and Hebrew means breath, spirit, and wind, all three. The next one is above, which means both above and again, in the same way that we would say from the top. If you've ever been in a band or orchestra or a dance company, they always dance, oh my. Anyway, if, if you've ever been in one of those, you know that when they're, you're rehearsing, uh, the director will say, okay, let's do that from the top. In music, we even say it, da capo, or in Spanish, una vez, or in, in or German, noch einmal. The third word is kingdom, and kingdom is a problematic word because in Greek, Kingdom can mean sovereignty, dominion, and a bunch of other things. And it also simply means kingdom, which is fairly opaque to those of us who live in the 21st century. So here's our text. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees whose name was Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night, him Jesus, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God because no one is able to perform the signs that you are performing unless God were with him. So here's Nicodemus, and he is locked into the whole Pharisee world. He is a Jew of the Jews. He's learned it. He's in leadership. He is the guy. But from his perspective of being entrenched in the institutional experience, he's seeing some things happening that are extremely outside the ordinary. And they're speaking to him that there is something extraordinarily good happening here. So he acknowledges the uniqueness, the superiority of Jesus. Jesus responds to him with one of these phrases that we find interesting in the New Testament. He says to him, truly, truly, I say unto you. And that's, this is a translation of hamen, hamen, meaning so be it, so be it. 
and what it really means in their idiom is, I'm testifying truthfully to you as if under oath, this is really reliable, and you should be listening to this. So Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born from above, remember above also means again, he is not able to see the kingdom, sovereign reign, dominion of God. So he talks to him about seeing things. Have you ever given directions or gotten directions? The direction person says, um, you go to the green water tower and turn left. And you say, okay, so I'm going to go to the green water tower and I'm going to turn left, right? And they say, right. And it's confusing. And so the real question is, did he mean again or did he mean above? And what does the kingdom of God mean? Imagine that you're with a young person and you've taken them to Yellowstone and you're, you're showing them Old Faithful Geyser for the first time. Very exciting, right? 145 feet in the air, hundreds of gallons of water just spewing up into the air and steam. Very exciting, very profound. People travel from all over the world to see it. The child might think it's magic, unless you explained it, right? And when you explain it, what does that explanation sound like? Yeah, it's hot water, honey. No, you have to go into it. You have to say, look, it's like a pressure cooker. And the child says, I've never seen a pressure cooker. You say, well, the, the, the water hits the really hot magma. And the child says, I don't know what magma is. Well, well, the water hits really hot rock, but the colder water on top puts a lid on it, holds it down until the water gets superheated well above. Well, never mind. The point is it, it blasts out. Here is... Jesus telling his friend Nicodemus, what's happening to you, Nicodemus, is that you're beginning to see spiritual things instead of just flesh things. You need to be born from above again. And for us, as we read it, he's saying exactly the same thing. The problem is that we have the other word that has a problem. These people of this era were completely steeped in what, what we would call a, an absolute monarchy. They knew what happened in a monarchy. If the President of the United States walked through that door today, we would show him respect, I hope. And as he came in the door, we would show him respect, but we would not be afraid because we know the limits of the President's power. In these days, if Caesar or Herod walked through the door, it would be time to be very, very afraid. Because in those days, what the king wanted, the king got. And if the king wanted you dead, you were dead. Better make a will. And if the king wanted to favor you, you better get a cart because you're going to have a lot to carry. They understood that. We don't necessarily understand it an absolute monarchy. Most of us have grown up in a place without, there's only a few monarchies left in the world. The uh, Arab Emirate states, Saudi Arabia, uh, there's a, what used to be called Swaziland, and the Vatican. Just not Brunei, don't forget Brunei. Those are absolute monarchies. The rest of us don't live with monarchies. We live in democracies with parliaments and, and congresses and senates, and, and we don't have to worry about the rule of law not applying to the king. See, we live in a universe with a completely sovereign God. But it's an easy thing to forget because he has for a time ceded some of his sovereignty to humans. And this sovereignty problem is what the world has been made of and the reason that the world has become chaotic and corrupt and deadly. Nicodemus was beginning to see through the chaos by looking at the Son of God in flesh. And he could begin to see glimpses 
of what Israel had been waiting for for so very long, for what we have been waiting for for 70, so, so very long. Now, Jesus is trying to explain what Jesus is seeing, I mean, what Nicodemus is seeing. He says, can you imagine that God is invading the corruption of the world? And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's elderly? The word would be better translated, elderly. He's not able to enter his mother's womb for a second time. Now, he's keying on the word again instead of the word above. Can he? And Jesus answered, again, truly, truly, I say to you, I'm testifying as if under oath, this is reliable, you need to listen to it. Unless someone is, someone is, that's a euphemism for you, right? And he's talking to Nicodemus and he means you, and he also means you, you, and he means me. He says, unless you are born of water and spirit, you are not able to enter the kingdom. Last time he was talking about see the kingdom, and he was saying, Nicodemus, you're being able to see a little bit of the kingdom because the Holy Spirit is working on you. But now, he says, if you want to enter the kingdom, you have to have the Holy Spirit and water. So Jesus introduces water into the discussion. Does this simplify things or make them more confusing? You've got to look at it from Nicodemus' perspective. Water, Genesis 1. Genesis 1-1, Genesis 1-2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the, and the earth was formless and empty. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the spirit, wind, breath, ruach, was of God, was covering, hovering over the surface of the waters. So when Jesus mentions water, the first thing that Nicodemus would have thought is creation, birth, the start, but then water was used to defeat Israel's enemies at the Red Sea. Then water was used to nourish Israel in the desert. And then at the Jordan River, water was used to distinguish the Hebrew nation as a nation of its own with a place of its own. So all that history with water floods back to Nicodemus. And then there's the image of John the Baptist. Repent and be baptized. And a turning for new birth. Jesus said, what is born of flesh is flesh. And what is born of the Spirit is spirit. So the Holy Spirit is working on Nicodemus to show him What's going on? And Nicodemus is profoundly moved by the insinuation of the Spirit into his life so that he can see that the glimpses of maybe what really has been promised to the nation of Israel and enough that he's willing to come at night and risk his friendship. All of his buddies see Jesus as a threat. Because for them, they're institutional. They know where they are. They know where they are in the pecking order, and they like it. But Jesus is upsetting the pecking order, and they're ready to be done with him. But Nicodemus, he is seeing through that. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's just a matter of perspective. Years ago, I used to represent a fellow who had a lot of hair salons. And he had some cosmetology schools. And I was sitting with him one day, and I said to him, you know, I, I, I think hair salons would be a great business. It's really neat. I'm, I'm really impressed by what you've done. I said, but I just can't stand the smell of permanent fluid. That permanent fluid, if, if anybody has ever had a home permanent or even a salon permanent, gentlemen, if you haven't had one yet, maybe you've smelled someone having one. It's a terrible smell. And I said to him, I just can't stand that smell. And he looked shocked, affronted. He says, uh, you don't like that smell? I said, no, it's terrible. And he said, I love that smell. It smells just like money to me. Nicodemus' friends were locked in their flesh thinking. And Nicodemus was beginning to get a picture from the Spirit he was becoming more spiritual. God's kingdom then and now is a spiritual kingdom. And in order to see it, in order to be a part of it, we have to be spiritual. 
Now, there are a lot of why questions in the Bible. There are a lot of things left unexplained. And if somebody tells you that they understand all of it and everything, that would be a person to be very wary of. The Bible has a lot of things that are unexplained. And here is Nicodemus, confused, coming to Jesus. And Jesus gives him explanations with these words that have multiple meanings that are very confusing for him. He knows that God's kingdom is supposed to come and invade the natural world, but when and how? And so he's asking Jesus how, and Jesus responds, don't be astonished that I said to you it's necessary for you to be born from above or again or from the top. The wind, spirit, breath blows everywhere it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from and where it's going. So it is of everyone who's born of the Spirit. He says the Spirit is working in you. You can feel it. You can know that it's happening, but you don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. But look around because the Spirit is going to enliven your eyes. The Spirit's going to enliven your ears. The Spirit's going to enliven your understanding. You're going to be able to have an opportunity to know spiritual things. Genesis 2, 5, there was no human being to cultivate the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. When Yahweh God formed the man, Adam, from the word Adama, red earth, of clay or dust from the ground, he blew into his nostrils breath, wind, spirit, ruach, and the man, Adam, red earth, became a living creature. Did man create himself? Remember when you were back in school and your teacher told you, don't write in the passive voice, your writing will be read, weak. Write in the active voice and your writing will be stronger. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus intentionally is using the passive voice to indicate that you don't born yourself. The Spirit borns you. Passive voice. The Genesis account also is in the passive voice. Nicodemus answered him and said, how can these things be? He's still very confused. Jesus in answer said to him, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, listen, it's reliable. Listen carefully. We speak what we know. Now he's using the royal we. I speak what I know. We testify what we have seen and yet you don't accept our testimony. You don't believe us. He's saying, I am the only one who's ever had first-hand experience with heaven, and I'm telling you about God's kingdom, but you can't believe me because you don't understand. He says, if I tell you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, me. He's saying, Nicodemus, I want to reveal stuff to you way beyond your imagination. I'd love to tell you about democracy. I'd love to tell you about geysers. I'd love to tell you about frozen ice caps on the earth and airplanes and other dimensions of being, and I'd really like to tell you about the 2300 days. But if you can't understand the basics of what's going on in your life right now, how can I tell you those things? He goes on to say, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so it's necessary that the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who trusts in him will have eternal life. Why in the world does Jesus bring up this bizarre story from the Old Testament? You remember the story. The, the, the people are in the wilderness of sin. No coincidence. They're in the wilderness of sin. It's spelled Z-I-N, but it's pronounced sin. And they're out there in the wilderness, and all of a sudden, it says God sent poisonous snakes, and they start biting people, and people start dying in large numbers. Well, as usual, they run to Moses and they say, Moses, we're dying in large numbers. There are snakes. What are we going to do? And Moses prays to God and God says, look, Moses, craft for yourself a snake. Put it on a pole and hold it up for everybody to see. And the scripture says that everyone who got bit by a snake and looked up at the pole lived. And people who got bit by a snake and didn't look up at the pole 
didn't live. Bizarre account, bizarre story from an Old Testament perspective. It makes no sense at all. But now Jesus puts a meaning to that story that the Old Testament people could never have figured out. Now, maybe there's a vaccine application, I don't know. Maybe there's a how do you make a snake stay on a stick? You have to put a cross piece. I don't know, maybe that's an application, I don't know. All speculation. What I do know is that Jesus is telling Nicodemus, look, in the Old Testament there's a story in which people had to look up at the pole to live. And he says, I'm going to be lifted up. And the people who look up at that pole and trust in me will not only live, they'll live forever. No more word game. Jesus now turns the page on all of these three-way words and all of this confusion, and he spells it out for Nicodemus and for you and for me in words that everyone can understand as clear as crystal, as clear as the bright daylight. He says, because this is the way God loved the world, that he surrendered his one and only son so that everyone who trusts him will not be lost, but will have perpetual life. Because God did not dispatch his son to the world so that he would condemn the world, but so the world through him would be saved on his account. The one trusting in him is not condemned, but the one not trusting has already been condemned because he is not trusting in the name of the one and only Son of God. And this is the verdict that the light has come into the world and the people took pleasure in darkness rather than the light because their activities were bad. Because everyone who behaves badly hates the light and doesn't come into the light so that his works are not punished. But the one who acts out the truth comes to the light so his works may be revealed that they are accomplished in God. So he spells it out very clearly. You see how all of a sudden all of the double word plays and all the rest are gone and he simply explains, look, this is it. I'm here to save you. Remember the uh, last scene of the original Star Wars movie? And I know some people hate movie illustrations. Last scene of the Star Wars movie. Remember that somebody got into the firing position. They went down the, the, the canyon and they used the targeting computer system and they fired and they missed. It was a failure, right? But then Luke gets into the canyon and, and Luke is the last, last plane. He's the last chance, the one and only chance that's left. And he's got one and only shot at this. And so he sets up his firing computer, targeting system, and then he realizes that already failed once, so he turns it off. He's in the canyon, and he just says, we're going to do this one by faith. Jesus is described, he describes himself as the one and only last chance, a portion of God's character. is put on earth as a human to have the chance to make right what our first parents made wrong. One shot. Failure was an option. And here he is, driving down the canyon, using nothing but trust in the Father. Most of you who are sports fans, know what a buzzer beater is. It's a terrible sounding name, isn't it? A buzzer beater in basketball. We're in a basketball gym this week. A buzzer beater means that the, the, the score of the game is tied or a point off. And the countdown is running to the end. And it's five, four, three, and from wherever the person who has the ball is, it's time to put it up. 
there's going to be no time in just a minute. For this very reason, the NBA has required that all the backboards have bright red lights that go off when the buzzer goes off so that you can't possibly know, not know when the buzzer goes off. So from wherever the player is on the court, the player has to loft the ball before the buzzer goes off, has to be off the fingertips before the buzzer goes off. You've seen examples of it. It goes from half court and beyond. They launch the ball, assuming there's no wind in the room. The buzzer goes off. The game is over the result is sealed. We don't know what the result is yet, but the result is sealed, and it cannot be changed. It cannot be altered. You can't touch the ball again because the game is over. Today, right now, right here, the book is already written. The victory has already been won. The ball is going in. We are past the buzzer. There is only one remaining question. Where will my name, where will your name be written? It's already written, you know. Where is it written? Is it written in the book of life? The victory is won. We got the book but we don't yet know where our names are written. Today, I want us to know. Will you pray with me, Heavenly Father, just today, just now, as we sit here before you in your presence, and we, we want to see your face. We want to know your truth. We want to know the end of the book, and we want to trust you up on the cross. Right now, we're making decisions. Many of us in this room right now are making a decision that we want to be in your book of life. And we know that you have promised to honor that decision. So we thank you for that decision. We thank you for honoring it. And we thank you for saving us even in this corrupt and chaotic world. There are others in this room who are not making that decision. Lord, we pray for them. We ask that you would please send your Holy Spirit to give them a vision of the rescue that's coming, a vision of the peace that you have for life, the opportunity that, that we each have to know you, to love you, to be a part of your sovereignty, your universe, your kingdom, here and forever. Please forgive us of our sins and give us the correct decision today because we ask for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.